Good to see everyone that is here today. It excites me that you make the effort to be here. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. If you notice when I sent out the scriptures, I only listed four or five, but there was a lot. It was a long range there. So we're going through a lot of reading, but not a lot of flipping around. If you're there, say amen. amen. It says, Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through the, his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. What do you think we're going to talk about today? It's not predestination. <laughs> response. This is our growing pains lesson on response. Let's pray. Lord, we love you, Jesus, and I thank you for those that are here, Lord. I thank you for giving us the opportunity to come to your service and be your church. Bless the word. Teach us, God. Continue to mold us. Continue to be patient with us, God. We love and we praise you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. The word predestinated was in there a couple different times. And it says having predestinated us and being predestinated according to purpose. Let me ask you, are we predestinated? Jonathan says no. Let me ask the class, without Jonathan speaking, who is Paul talking to? Paul is writing his letter. Paul is going right now. Who is Paul talking to? The church of Ephesus, which the saint, the church is predestinated. Jesus is coming back for the church. He's coming back for the bride. The individual is not predestinated. The collective group is. Everybody understand the difference? Okay. You could. So, in a way, the church is destined for glory. And that's a big deal. Because by design, the individual is not destined for glory. We are all created with a sinful nature. That's another Bible study. I don't believe we are by the, I don't believe we are all the born sinners. I don't believe that baby Joy, when she came out of the womb, was a sinner. I don't believe that infants, when they die, a stillborn, go to hell because they're sinners. But I believe we're born with a sinful nature, and if left to our devices, we become sinners. Because that's our destiny. We're destined to become sinners. That's our nature. That's who we are. But how do you change your destiny? How does someone change who they are?
Well, how do you do that? Repent. Huh? Repent. Repent. Brandon, what were you saying? Changing your mind. But, okay. You're not going deep enough. Brandon, you're, you're a baseball player. If you were, in, in the years to come, hopefully a few more years, you're, you're going to eventually have a child, and you're going to teach that child how to throw a baseball. You can't just say, throw the ball. You've got to teach it the mechanics of throwing the ball. I'm asking the mechanics of how to change. Can't you say change? Choices is the word I was looking for. Only so I could slap it back down and say that's not enough. <laughs> because we always say choices. Choices gets preached so many times. The power of choice. We, we hammer that word, but choice is an incomplete answer. Yes, it starts with choice. How many people made the choice to come to church and they're here? That's great. But notice it took more than a choice to get here. Well, we get told all the time by people, I'm going to see you at church Sunday. And they never show up. It takes effort. It takes action. Faith without works is dead. Now see, we say that so often that we really, I don't think we really appreciate the context of what I just said and what we quote. We know that faith without works is dead. But I want us to read that passage and it's 12 verses. Did you know that? The, the, the concept of faith without works is 12 verses? We don't really understand exactly the depth of what James was saying there. Let's go to James chapter 2 verse 14. And again, this is our growing pains lessons on response. We're going to dig deep, a little deeper on our responding. James is a little further in the New Testament, closer to the Revelations. That should tell you something when I said it's 12 verses. You know, we always quote it like it's one, like he just randomly popped, you know, said it. But no, he went 12 verses deep explaining. Uh oh, she's starting. Do you, have, do you need a bottle? Okay. You know, it's funny, I, I spend a lot of time listening to our services online and I can hear you do that. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all ready? Yes. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, made a choice, and hath not works, did anything about the choice? Can faith save him? Is choice enough? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Man, that's like those people saying, My thoughts and prayers are with you. Well, that doesn't really help them a whole lot, now does it? If you've got the ability, if you've got the resources to feed them, and all you're doing is giving them thoughts and prayers, Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works? He wasn't justified because he believed. He was justified because he took his son and was willing to kill him. When he offered Isaac his son upon the altar, seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? 
perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which said, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith alone. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. A choice is not enough. It's not enough to believe in God. You have to respond to God. Now let me tell you something. We picked on the folks for, to, for choosing to come to church and not coming. But let me tell you, it's not enough to come to church. You have to respond to church. There is zero difference coming and sitting on a pew and not moving for an hour and a half than the people who don't come to church at all. You are no more sanctified than the atheist if you don't clap your hands, raise your hands, and come to an altar. You are, you've got nothing on them. It's not enough to hear the preaching. You have to respond to the preaching. We're talking about changing destinies, ch changing our, our sinful nature to being destined from hell to becoming predestined with the church to heaven. Bartimaeus was, was a second generation blind man. He was, his father was blind, Bartimaeus, son of a blind man. He was born from a blind man, he was blind, he was destined to be blind, and he changed his destiny. Not by believing Jesus could heal him, but by responding to the presence of Jesus. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Now listen, this is the growing pains portion of it. Because the people tried to shush him. Be quiet. It's going to take some persistence. It's going to take some effort. You're going to ruffle some feathers. You, know, you may have to scream louder, Jesus! Thou son of David, have mercy on me. You're going to have to irritate some folks. Your family may not like it. Your wife may not like it. Your husband may not like it. Your brother and your sister may not like it. But you need to respond to change your destiny. It's going to require changes. It's going to require letting go. It's going to require new habits. It's going to require new friends. It's going to require letting go of old friends. It may require being alone. It just may very well require isolation. I use this story a lot, but Man, it, it'll preach. And someone needs it now, I can feel it in my spirit. I remember having a teenager talk to me, and, and she was hanging out with a horrible influence. And I asked her, I said, why do you hang out with this person? Every time you're with this person, you get in trouble. I said, they're, they're winning you. They're influencing you more than you're influencing them because they've never been to church. But yet you've been to detention. You've been suspended. You've been in, in everything else. So they're winning you. You're not winning them. And, she's, and she said, but she's the only friend I have. Then you live alone. Then you don't have a friend. Cannot justify being friends with the devil just so you have a friend. <laughs> Remember the story of Ezekiel and the dry bones? I'm starting to, we've laid our foundation now of responding. I want to take it another step now. You know, God told him, showed him this valley of dry bones, and we could argue all day whether or not it was a real valley or a vision. That doesn't matter if it was real or not. The point is still valid. He showed him this valley of dry bones. And 
What did he tell Ezekiel to do with the vow? What was Ezekiel's order? What was his call? Yeah, the word of God. Not Ezekiel. Okay, bones to hear the word of God. The bones had to hear it. So what did Ezekiel have to do? Preach it, preach it. He had to speak the word. God asked him, can these bones live? Thou knowest. He had faith. But he had to respond to the call. Speak to these bones. Preach the word. And he did. And the bones started to come together. Out of nowhere, they started to form together. Like some weird tales from the crypt movie. Now they weren't alive yet. Now they're just lumped together, a bunch of dead bodies. Kind of creepy. God told him to speak to the wind. And he did. And the wind blew life in them. And now they're alive and there was an army. My, my, my question here, so Ezekiel had to respond to the call. And after he responded, twice, once was not enough. He had to continue to respond to get the army that he needed. You remember those Bible studies that I, I handed out to you? Everybody ordered. And I wonder if our army is sitting out there. I wonder how many of us have yet to speak to the dead bodies. How many of us have yet to speak to the Valley of Dry Bones and be with God, God gave you a call. But you're still sitting on those Bible studies. Or maybe you did it once. Thinking you're done. But Ezekiel had to keep doing it. You've got to respond to the call that God's put in your life. You've got to keep responding. It's not enough to believe that God can. You have to do your part. Every miracle in the Bible, God did it through somebody. Except for creation. God used somebody. And you're all hoping it's going to be somebody else because it requires you to do something. Being available is not the action. You cannot just lay on the couch and say, all right, you need to sit on a pew and say, okay, God. No, you're going to have to get up, move a muscle, and step forward and do what he tells you to do. And that's the response. Movement. Some of us have not done the Bible study because we need more time. You don't need more time. You don't need more faith. What you need is more backbone. You're gutless. Boy, that hurt, didn't it? See? Okay, I feel so lucky. I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm just trying to be real. You're scared. You're scared of what's going to happen if you don't win. You're scared of what's going to happen if you don't do it right. Tough noogies. You've got to do it anyway. That's what Acts 1 and 8 was all about. That he shall give you power after you receive the Holy Ghost, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. You can do it. But you'll never do it just sitting there being afraid. I can't stand a coward. Coward has never been me. You've got to step out, you've got to respond. This church needs you to respond to the call that he put in your life. There are dead bones out there waiting on you to respond. There may be dead bones in your house waiting on you to respond. But you don't need more time. Let's talk about time for a minute. Let's go to Mark chapter 2, verse 13.
Mark 2, 13. And he, referring to Jesus, went forth again by the seaside, and all the multitude resorted unto him, and he taught them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi. Quick pop quiz. Who's Levi? What's the other name known for the known? What's Levi's other name? Hey. Good job, Sister Hall. <laughs> oh, I know two people I'm disappointed in. The other one won't even look at lift his head up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom, and said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. Now, that's exactly how it happened. He's walking by. He looked at Matthew, said, Follow me, and kept going. And there's other people that he walked by, said, follow me, and he kept going. Let me ask you, what is taking you so long to respond? Why do you sit there as if he's going to wait on you? Levi had to respond immediately. Jesus is passing him by. We're letting grace spoil us. We know in our mind, we think we have time. We're used to having another church service. We're used to having another opportunity. But imagine if you can physically see Jesus walking by and you know it's now or never. Come judgment day, there's going to be a lot of wasted grace. You don't need more time. Jesus is not expecting you to take your time. He's expecting you to respond. Let's step it up another aspect. Let's go to 2 Kings 13 and 14. our last bit of reading. I'll stay here for a minute. I'm encouraged by the pages turning. Just wish I could still read that. Thirteen. Y'all ready? Okay. Now, Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness, whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And Elisha said unto him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put thy hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it, and Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot, and he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance, and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek, till thou hast consumed them. And he said, Take the arrows. And he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, Smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice and stayed. And the man of God was wroth with him and said, Thou should have had smitten five or six times. Then had it thou smitten Syria till thou hadst consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. Now let's be real here. Joash did what he was told to do and got rebuked for it. All right? 
He obeyed 100%. Did Elisha say, smite it five or six times? Nope. He didn't even say smite it three times. He said smite it. Joash technically went above and beyond by smiting it three. And he got rebuked for only smiting it three. The point here that can be preached is half-heartedness. Joash obeyed, but he would half-heartedly obey. Because Elisha told him what it represented. He told him this represents your deliverance in your, from Syria. Wouldn't that have put a little more emphasis into it? I mean, if I gave you a baseball bat and a watermelon, okay, and I said this watermelon represents everything that's been attacking your family, wouldn't you go to town? Unless you didn't really believe me. And you were just doing it to shut me up. Right. Or you're doing it because you felt obligated. Does that make sense? Do you think that's what Joash was doing here? He was appeasing the old man. And that is what Elisha rebuked him with. My question to you today, is that what you do with God now? With your pastor now? Do you respond to what the pastor has put on your heart? He puts it on my heart to give to you. And do you really believe and do you really respond with the faith that God's asking you to respond with? Or do you do things just to shut me up? Just to say you obey? Your motivations matter. As you can tell by that story, your motivations matter. If for example, let's take baptism. Baptism in Jesus' name is required. But if you only get baptized in Jesus' name because I preach it, it does you no good. If you're not baptized in Jesus' name because you have the faith and desire to have your sins washed away and be buried in Jesus' name, then you only get wet. So why are you doing the things you're doing? Why are you responding the way you're responding, and are you responding accordingly? That will explain your worship. That explains why I'm so heavy-handed on worship, because motivations matter. God does not want half-hearted response. He says, lift up holy hands. So we don't do this. This is not worship. If this is not worship, then this definitely is. Motivation matters. You can clap. And still not be worshipped. You can sing and still not be worshipped. What about your how you respond to the preaching? Like I mentioned, are you and not just saying amen and uh, I, I I appreciate the verbal responses. That's and that is exciting. And yes, I, I wish we would do more of that. And, it's, it's uh, contagious. The more you verbally uh, respond, the more others get engaged, and the more you get engaged, and it's a healthy culture. But I'm referring to the lifestyle responses. 
Let's do a quick test. I don't want any. Oh, I'm going to close my eyes. I don't want any. I don't want anyone to answer because I don't want to know. I'm just going to do it. I just want you to answer to yourself. I've taught them not being ignorant, and I've asked everyone to read a book outside the Bible. If you have not done that by now, that was months ago, then you have not responded to what God has laid on your heart, because I know how heavy God put it on my heart. Everyone here has had time. You are not too busy. You are not too sick. You are not too dumb. You are not too slow. You have just not made a priority to respond to what God is trying to do in this church. What about Bible reading? I've asked the challenge the church to read your Bible through. Have you kept up? Are you moving through? Or are you just too busy doing everything but responding to what God is trying to do with this church? What about evangelism? I talked about evangelizing and reaching out. Have you done anything different than what you've been doing? Have you asked anyone new other than... I'm not talking about the same old people. Have you tried anything different? We mentioned the Bible studies. I'm telling have you responded? Just you can't tell me you have faith if you haven't done anything different. Because faith without works is dead. The worship. We talked about that with your hands, with your clapping, your singing. Baptism. Are you baptized in Jesus' name? If not, you need to be. No, oh, I didn't want to look. I don't want to know. For all I know, you're all killing it. But I can feel in my heart we're not. You're not taking it seriously. You're just like Joe Ash. Half-hearted hearing me, amen to me on Sundays, amen to me on Wednesdays, and forgetting about it throughout the week. Making up excuses on why you can't do what God is laying out for the church to do. We say we want the church to grow, but you refuse to do what it takes to grow. What you really want is everyone else to grow and just carry you along for a piggyback ride. That way you don't have to exert the effort. In, in closing, Jesus died on the cross and he had two thieves. Both had the same destiny, but they had different conclusions. They both responded, but one responded differently than the other. How are you going to respond today? Do we have any questions, comments, or concerns about the lesson?